Yeah, we got our first um, Sub Zero call in today. Um, so we're going to see how that goes. Uh, I, I was, the house that we went to today was really, really nice, but they were selling it. Um, and it had like those fancy drawer tracks where you got to squeeze the, so instead of like having the cabinet doors, like a lot of cooktops have under it, it had those, it had three drawers and it had these fancy little clips underneath of them, which I'd never seen before. So that was interesting to play with and see how those worked. Cool. Yeah. yeah, TK, how how are you feeling about the high end stuff so far? I know that a week or two ago you were thinking that it was like something new or something different, and some of the guys were were telling you, you know, it's just the same stuff. It's you just need to get over that sort of mental hurdle of like higher end is different. But um, have you been doing enough of them to kind of revisit that? How are you feeling? I've I've, I've only done three of them, so I'm still uh, learning. Um, and hopefully, um, we'll start getting more calls in on them because I've added it to my, um, brands at AHS. And we also, um, signed up with Wolf Sub-Zero and Viking. So hopefully they'll start sending us some calls too. Nice. And remind me, what's the split between your war warranty jobs versus COD jobs? The split, yeah. uh, oh, how many I get? I'd say, I'd say 50-50, about 50-50. Okay. I do about 50% AHS work and then I do about 50%, I'd say it's probably 50% AHS, 25% COD and 25% property management. Okay, cool. I can't see that far. No, How's it good. going Bernard, Cruz, Mike, welcome. What's going on, fellas? I'm getting ready to stuff my face, so I'm hungry. Oh, turn the video back on, man. We won't watch you stuff your face. No, How's no. How's it going, fellas? <laughs> I got me a bag of these Lucky Charm marshmallows. Ooh. It's good. A whole What's bag that? of marshmallows? Yeah, man. All the joy without all that crappy cereal. <laughs> What's uh what's new with you, Bernard? Um uh, not too not really too much. Um you know, still grinding, you know, doing my thing. Um yeah, I like I, I wanted to comment on the, the high end stuff. Yeah, like somebody said, it is, it's just like the the, the regular stuff. Um Mealy Mealy has a um it's real helpful too. It's called a M M M U P M D U. And it's uh, it, you hook up to the refrigerators, and uh, it it takes you right through the whole diagnostic process. You can you can run your fans right from the computer. You, you can you can run your compressor. You can check your uh, sensors. Yeah, right from this uh, computer, man. It's, it's it's awesome. You can figure but, out how but, the optic works. It works great. Huh? You can figure out how the optic works, where it goes. It works great, but half the time it's fine. Right, well, that's yeah. Uh, well, you could you uh, it, it. All you have to do is uh when you the on right with like the. I think I want to call it the crisper right there. It's usually you tap it and and it lights up for you. Where you put the uh. Where you plug in that. You've never used them on the dishwashers or on the coffee. No, maker. no. I, no, I don't. I don't. I don't like the coffee makers, man, because they like they so delicate. Um, they 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 break easy, so I, I kind of shied away from the uh, coffee makers. But well, and the dishwashers, I pretty much got those down. Afraid of nothing, and your coffee makers are. <laughs> you got to work on it all. Man. <laughs> work yeah. on everything. <laughs> yeah. Um, and is that available for everyone, or is that something you have to be in war warranty? Yeah, I think, I think I'm. I, you know, don't quote me on this, but uh, I, I think if it, 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 you would have to be in warranty, um, because when I got that, when I got that computer, I I was working for a company, doing warranty work, but we was we was, we was like eighty percent uh, COD, and um, mm -hmm. well, when you work with Mealy, 
you got to they they going to throw you some some warranty work but um most of they calls uh, uh most of it is, is going to be sealed most of it's going to be sealed decals um but you know uh i had to go through a like a 13 module training and and before i before they let me in the, before they let me start working on merely appliances um i had to finish those modules um the actual, the manufacturer wouldn't let me work on the appliances until I, I i got those modules done well cool no there's some good stuff in here um when it comes to to working on the high end whatnot um i i had a request for like a certain topic request but the requester is not here so um i don't know if any of you guys had anything on your mind um anything that you want to kind of pick each other's brains with uh questions for the group but uh just you know, opening up the mics for anybody. Yes. Um, hi, guys. Uh, I hope um, everyone is doing fine. And thanks for um, this group. Um, my question or what I'm having trouble with is diagnosing uh, dishwashers. So I was wondering, or I wonder if it is a, um, a place, a website, or a link, you know, something where um, I can go uh, a, little, a little more in detail about this washer, uh, this washers. Right now I have just kind of like the basics, you know, uh, like, okay, the water valve is supposed to do this, or, you know, the flood device, dog lock, you know, but I'm not very experienced into that. Half the time what I do is I reset the, the mod, you know, the control board and it helps, but um, I'm not always, you know, um, too handy about that. So anyhow, will be appreciated. I know, I know. I got this. There was a bunch of there was a bunch of noise from somebody's mic. I could I couldn't hear half of what he said. Cruz, I apologize. Could you repeat some of that? Just just like the last like maybe a little bit of what you said because there was some kind of noise on somebody's mic. Sorry about that. It was my dog. Uh, he, oh, was, okay. he was telling me. It was, was your wild. wife. Yeah. <laughs> so um, anyway, um, yes, um, I'm having a little hard time with diagnosing um, these washers. Um, I haven't been doing this for, you know, for too long. And um, I kind of like just go to the basics on these washers, but I want to get a little more in detail. So when I go and make my diagnosis, you know, I am a little more hundred percent sure. You know, like no hundred, but you know, more more sure about what I'm diagnosing. So, any right. links, website, or place where I can get more, you know, information about it? Um. Well, I would definitely. Uh, what, what, I, I guess. What is your training? Do you have any training on dishwashers, or are you br completely brand new to dishwashers? Uh. I have very minimum training. Um, most of the stuff is for what I read on the appliance uh, book. I call it the Bible, the appliance Bible. Um, and some of that, you know, is just from uh, watching YouTube videos, you know, and, and stuff like that uh, about the, you know, the very, the very basics. Um, how you like, to? you know, um, the the wire valve. Um, Flood device, door lock, you know, stuff like that. Uh, but there are times where I don't know if, you know, if it's the mother pump or is the control board, you know, just like the little more details. Uh, I mean, I, I guess, you know, the, the, uh, the advice I can, I can give you, man. I mean, as far as what I did and what I always do, um, and this is with every appliance, I, I I break the appliance down. Like okay, so take the 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 dishwasher, right? You said dishwashers, right? Yes. The, yeah. So I, I break it down like uh, uh, to the to electrical system, the water system, and, and you know the mechanical system, and. Uh, and I look at the appliance in, in, in that kind of manner, you know, 
And learning the appliances, learning the components on any appliance is 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 and what it does. What the components, if if you are if you're able to identify the components on a on an appliance and pretty much know what it does. And pretty much know the sequence of operation. You can, you can, um, you can, you could pretty much figure that out. Um, so yeah, I, I just break, I break the appliance down, and and then I, I delegate the uh, whatever symptom it is to 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 that to that group, and and I attack it like that. There aren't necessarily a whole lot of resources to learn appliance repair, in my opinion. You can do all your YouTube research and your appliance Bibles and get your basics just like you've done. Uh, but I do have kind of a cool idea for you if Alex will play along. Alex, can you be a customer for a minute? Yeah. So um, I'm having trouble with my dishwasher. I don't know what's going on. It's just not draining well. Um, yes, sir. You, you say it's not draining well. Have you noticed any other symptoms, any poor washing or dirty smells or anything out of the ordinary like that? Well, yeah, I mean, it smells pretty bad since that water has been sitting in there. All right. So we've got a no drain complaint. That's where we're at. How would you diagnose that, Cruz? So first thing I do, I always check um, the air gap um, just to make sure, you know, there is nothing clogging there. Um, I go through um, the whole um, start the dishwasher and, cancel, you know, press the cancel button. So to make sure it's draining the water. Uh, and then I go inside and if it hasn't drained the water, I go inside, take out the filter and start kind of like going, you know, going from the inside the dishwasher uh, to see if it's something that is stuck on, on the, um, you know, the drain area. So to go from there and then I will go, and if it's still nothing there, then I will go and try to disconnect the hose, one of the hoses, to make sure there's nothing clogged there. If okay, nothing, so you've eliminated all your blockages, but you never heard your drain pump kick on. There's no blockages in the in the lines. There's no blockages in the filter. No blockage in your drain motor. Uh, so nothing's blocking the system at this mm -hmm. point. Established. What would you do from there? You can't hear the drain pump hum. There's no hum. So I disconnect the, the drain pump and normally I put my leads and press the cancel uh, and press the um, and press the, the, the start button. And not the first thing you know it should kick it or, or the cancel button or one of those tools and it should start sending uh, power to my a drain pump. If I get 120, then that means I am getting power to the drain pump, but if it's not, much then I kind of like tells me the the control board, or um, it is the the drain pump. Okay, I think you're doing a lot better than you think you are. Uh, and if I get the one yeah. twenty, then yes, you know, the the drain pump. I was gonna I was gonna say the same thing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think you have I, a lot less think... nervous about than you think you do. It sounds like yeah, you're. I, as far as no drain goes, you sound solid. Okay, I'm going to give yeah. you another one. My dishes are dirty. What would you do to go ahead and start diagnosing mm -hmm. a dirty dishes? Oh, shit. Um, now, this is seriously where experience comes into play because there are mm -hmm. at least 10 different things that can cause dirty dishes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, first, I... I, I I check the the arms, uh, the spray arms, but uh, just to make sure there is nothing that is clogged uh, on the holes. And if it is, uh, I mean, ha half the time I find something that is clogged there. So I, you know, I say this is a problem. But if it's not, then um, I will go with how much soap are you using. Or, you know, if you're um, drain, like, again, uh, going back to the drain trap, um, make sure there's nothing stuck there. Okay, so you've started the dishwasher, you hear the drain motor kick out all the water, you hear the water valve come on, you hear the motor come on, you've checked your spray arms, everything yeah. seems to be okay, you don't notice any major suds build up. Mm -hmm. What happens if there's not enough water? Oh. <laughs> 
Then, um, then uh, I, I will say is is a bad dry, um, either the um, the drain valve, like the the, no, the water valve. I'm sorry, the water valve is 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 no opening all the way through, and it's not sending much water that it needs to, or something. Um, like is is clock on the line and the line that goes from the the water valve to the inside. You're doing a lot better than you realize. Absolutely. You got it, Cruz. Okay. I think you're doing all right. <laughs> okay. You might think you're doing the basics, but those basics count for a lot. Okay. A dishwasher is a dishwasher is a dishwasher. It fills, mm -hmm. washes, and drains. Mm -hmm. That's, the basics are everything. Okay, okay, I, and you know that's why kind of like you know makes me feel like okay I am on the right in the in the right track you know, just because uh, I haven't been doing this for a long time you know and sometimes I have to learn it on the fly or you know kind of that's Google exactly right it, uh, you know Google it like right before I go into the house you know stuff like that. So you're probably you gonna learn something every day for the rest of your career. Whew. <laughs> it's always going to be on the fly sometimes. Okay. Okay. Well, you know, that really helps me a lot, guys. Yeah, I think um, I think you got to have a little bit more faith in your ability to diagnose the problem. Because, mm -hmm. um, yeah, from, from what I heard, man, you got to down pat, man. Um, yeah, just have heard... faith in, 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 in your diagnostic process, man, and, and you pretty much got it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. you were saying something about boards earlier, Cruz. Um, boards or user interfaces they all pretty much diagnose the same on any machine you're working on you know one talks to the other you know so because i know you said that was one of your concerns when you opened up um and sometimes you get screwed sometimes you mm -hmm. but but it, you just the board thing and the user interface thing you know and then like you said you're going to start seeing these a lot more you're going to get more competent you're going to run into a whirlpool you push a button you already know what you got to do to it you know well, one button lights up here you already know the user interface is shot or you pull and clean the pin maybe something i don't know what well, depends on what you're running in um but no it, i hate dishwashers too yeah i think that was the, my main you know the one that i have most problems with now, now let me ask you this if you run into a dishwasher and this is for anybody um if you have to pull that dishwasher do you guys automatically tack on an insulation fee or how do you do that not if it's part of diagnostics if i have to diagnose yeah. it then that's that's my loss not theirs yeah, i get yeah, that but yeah. what about what about the repair uh that's going to be based on <laughs> it's not going to be an automatic installation fee but my labor bill probably is going to go up 20 percent right. at least Okay. All right. Yeah, that's what I was wanting to know. I just, no, um, because you know that's when I start pulling machines, my my repair bill gets a little high. You know, so. I think. Uh, no, same I, thing with the built built thing. Same thing with the built-in oven. You, you, you know, I if I got to pull it out to change that stupid fan on the back of a KitchenAid, or they put the or the or a high limit on the back of it for some stupid reason, you know. Um, you guys were talking about charging per hour. You know, we started that way a um, while ago, and I've since not been trying to do that. You know, simple jobs, you know. Um, but uh, yeah, I just, just seen how, how it doesn't always what high does not always mean unfair, right? I agree. It's like you said last week, you, you priced something out for 800 and she didn't bat an eye. And I was like, you know, that's some of these people are just. They're, hey, they're okay with it. They don't argue, and you know I can sleep good at night. <laughs> I did that job today. <laughs> yeah, no, I I always encourage. I'm always talking about trying to put yourself in the other people's shoes, or like put your mind in where the other person's head's at. Um, and if you start looking at things that way, and looking at people that way, and thinking through your interactions with them that way, you'll start to get a sense for, you know, is this the kind of person that is going to bad an eye at $800 or is this going to the kind of person that might, you know, have a huff and puff over 200, um, you know, but, uh, but yeah, and the concept that I was hearing you guys talk cruise through, it, it really applies in a lot of things. You're never going to know all the individual little incremental details, but if you have a good grasp of like the concepts and the foundations of something, you're going to be able to figure things out. 
Cool. Um, welcome, Zach and Jeffrey. You guys slipped in while we were chatting. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't know if there's anything else on your guys' mind. Um, otherwise, we can talk some topics that uh, that were requested about hiring, training. I don't know how many of you guys, let's see like a quick show of hands, how many of you guys um, are dealing with or are going to need to be dealing with hiring and training? Yeah, so I only see one hand up, but I know TK is also in there. I mean, I don't know. What, so what's... Uh, Go ahead. Well, I'm sorry. I was checking a text message. What did you say? Oh, I was just, I want to know if there's anything that's on the tip of your guys' tongue or the tip of your guys' mind that you want to talk about. Otherwise, I have a backup topic that we can get some chatter going on. Yeah, I got a quick thing real quick. Go ahead. Take your time. Hello. Welcome, gentlemen. How's everyone doing? Um, Pretty good. <clears throat> been uh, been working. Been running a pretty consistent up here in New York, New Jersey. And um, but one thing I noticed that I avoid refrigeration like the plague. So as just quickly, if someone had a gun to your head and they said, All right, how would you how would you tell somebody the newbie who didn't know nothing, particularly no cool calls? How would you point someone in the right direction who's ready to tackle no cools and then eventually ease your way in the sealed system repair? How would, how understand would the frost that? pattern. Excuse me? Understand the frost pattern of the evaporator coil. Mm, okay. Look at an evaporator coil and know what's going on. You're going to be able to be a champion of refrigeration. For example, you've got a frost, you've got a coil and half of it's frosted up or a third of it's frosted up. Pretty good chance that you're either low on refrigerant or there's nothing to pull the air across. Got a full frost pattern, heavy frost, no air is going through it. It's a defrost issue. No frost at all, no refrigerant, you know, sealed system issue. When you look at an evaporator coil, you're going to start to just literally be able to know exactly what's wrong with that coil. That's all so it is. An, refrigeration is so air an evaporator air. coil, an evaporator coil would like be the most common telltale sign of a no cool problem. Yep. Gotcha. Okay. It'll point you right in the right direction. So um, it's just process of elimination. All right, cool. Yeah, man. Like I said, I I avoid all refrigeration, <laughs> and I know I'm losing a lot of money. On the yeah. it, it's almost. I mean, it's really not that common for it to be a sealed system issue. Right. That's another thing, which is why I don't do it because I have I ran into that. Like, okay, the sealed system. I don't do that. Now we really got a problem. That's an automatic. You know what I'm saying? Um, at least I find more times than not, way more times than not, it's not a sealed system issue. It's, you know, a thermistor issue, airflow issue, defrost issue. Yeah, those are the things I got to be able to diagnose and, you know, get to the bottom of. Yeah. Just start, just tackle I mean, them. You know, so it, when I, I came into the uh, appliance industry, I started, I started um, doing doing HVAC, I started, I, I got my universal certification. And, um, and to be honest with you, I mean, I love, I love, uh, I love HVAC, man, but to be honest with you, appliance repair is a little bit more difficult. And, oh. I, and the reason why I say that is because it's so many appliances out there that you, you, we, you can't know all of it first. And, um, and there's so many systems out there and, and they come out with so many different new systems so, so, so quick. Um, for me, um, refrigeration pretty much came simple um, um, because, and, and you know, I, it was funny to me when I started to learn the lingo of um, appliance repair, I used to be like, um, you know, why do they call it a sealed system? It's, it's the refrigeration cycle. <laughs> and, um, but, but it was, it, it pretty much came simple to me because I came from that background. But when you talk about uh, diagnosing refrigerators, like, like, like a lot of guys were saying, most of your issues are, are gonna be dirty condensers. Um, fan motor stop working evaporator or condenser um 
defrost timer, defrost thermostat. Um, no, no, uh, no, no airflow in the refrigerator. The the damper stuck open or or closed. So you're gonna have a, a bunch of those issues. Rarely, you're gonna come across like sealed system issues where you have to, you know, take the compressor out. And, I came from an HVAC background too, and when I first got into appliances, I I figured it'd be a lot like that. But if if your brain works good for HVAC, then you know if you comprehend, you know the refrigeration cycle, then and all the electronic components is easy to shift over. Um, how do you guys, for those who, if you go out and diagnose a refrigeration problem, no cool. You know it's a seal system issue. You don't do that. You you don't tap into it. Only way for the problem to be corrected is a seal system. How do y'all wiggle your way out of that? If you tell them you got a guy. Systems. Yeah. Tell them you you got to have a guy. You gotta have you gotta have somebody. It's hard to retain customers that way, but uh, right, you gotta right, trust right. him and hope he's not going in there to snake you out. But um, you, you know, I don't I don't tap sealed systems either. I don't. But I, I just don't. Uh, if it's a sealed system problem, I got a guy. I just trust it. I send him over. He'll take care of him. Do I lose a service call? Yeah, sometimes I do. Sometimes I don't. It all depends. Um, do that's I split what... it with that guy? No, I just he, that's him. Let him do his thing. You know. But yeah, I don't. I don't tap systems. You know. But I do do refrigeration. Uh, no cools and all that. Whatever. Um, and then, like we said last week, the LGs. I I cherry pick them. I just call Sears. Or if you got an authorized guy, call this guy, you know, LG, no cool. I'm not coming. <laughs> yeah, that's what I've basically been doing for five years and I got sick and tired of it. So we are taking our, uh, uh, as well as high end appliances, we're now taking a venture into sealed systems. Um, but what I've actually started doing recently is, um, using a local guy that I trust and um, subbing the work to him. And he's he's top notch. So I know that he's going to take, he treats his customers the same way I treat my customers. So I know that the quality is there because I wouldn't use a sub that I don't trust. And I don't think, I don't know that uh, um, he's going to do the same caliber of work that I do. Yeah, you guys are 100% right. Um, I got a buddy and he, he does that, you know, if it's a, problem with the seal system needs to be tapped in so he has somebody he can call and that the guy who he has gets him out of a lot of jams and they make a lot of money together so yeah man having having somebody having that teammate is crucial you know i definitely gotta find yeah. that yes i think i've always talked about this um on my youtube <clears throat> channel is having a network if you no one in my area is really my enemy at all or or you know if, if every respectable technician in my area i want to be friends with um because i never know when they're going to bail me out of something matt <laughs> matt bails me out of stuff on a weekly basis <laughs> so <laughs> it, and uh at the end of the day you know there's plenty of appliances out here to fix um and you know we don't have to you know necessarily personally fix everyone and sometimes you do have to waive a service call if you go out there and you can't do it you know let them know give them your magnet say hey listen i really apologize we don't do sealed system work but here's uh here's my magnet if you need anything in the future i'm gonna give you the number of the guy i would recommend mm. um, and you can either charge them or not charge them you can give them a reduced service fee you're the owner of the business you can do whatever whatever you think is right in that situation. If it's a little old lady that, that you know, is surviving off of social security, I'm not charging her a service call because I wouldn't sleep well that night. I'd rather lose 65 bucks than charge little Miss Johnson because, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't help her. It's not losing 65 bucks, so you're just losing that little bit of time. Yeah, and you're gaining a customer I, I for that. life. Yeah, exactly, but I, I do that more often than I would like, but it's yeah, kind of, yes, you know, nice. sleeping at night. Now, I, I, I want to, um, I want to dig into this a little bit. Um, cause what I've run into a, a good amount, uh, working with appliance repair businesses is there's definitely most of the time there's some situation where it's like, Hey, we don't, 
do that brand. We don't do that appliance type. We don't do that type of job. And probably the worst thing that can happen is when a customer is looking for something that they don't do um, and they're met with a, sorry, we don't do that, period. Um, whether it's a uh, referral, like, hey, talk to this person. Um, did I hear right? It sounds like some of you guys are talking about actually having like a contractor almost in your back pocket. So the service is performed under your business name, but you bring that contractor in to do that specialized work. But then there's also referrals. So I'd like to hear from you guys a little bit like on how you look at the difference between those two. When do you make the decision to actually find a contractor versus just refer out and create that network? I, I just refer. Um, I, I mean, I, there's like, there's enough business out there for everybody. That's not that it's not that cutthroat of a business or, you know, uh, industry, but I just, I don't, you know, we used to sub, we used to try and split it, but I'm not a paperwork guy. I think paperwork is a headache. And <laughs> if I just refer him and, you know, you know, yeah. Do it, it, does he, he gets the face to face with the customer. Yes. Um, but if he does a good job, will she remember me or he remember me? Maybe, um, maybe not, but as stated earlier, there's everybody, there's not enough of us, you know, to mm. be out there fighting over, you know, and, and again, you know, what, what, you know, what are you going to split the guy 50, 50, like, like he would, or 60, 40, whatever it is. I just, I'm not a paperwork guy. Just assume him have it. And hopefully he's, you know, well, my guy's pretty good. You know, I've sent Bobby to a couple of calls. I don't know where he's at tonight, but, uh, <laughs> You know, they, they like Bobby. So, as long, you know, as long as he's not out there snaking them, you know, it's fine with me. That's my biggest, my biggest fear is, you know, you know, you send that guy out there and he's as good, if not, you know, maybe he's as good, if not better than you. And, you know, you might lose that customer. But again, that's the price I pay for not doing sealed systems. It's just the way it is. I mean, I'm the uh, contract E, I guess, in that situation. I've got a buddy that, I used to work with that has his own business, but he doesn't mess with sealed system stuff. So I don't do it under his business. I do it under mine. Um, do you do you kick him anything back? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I don't know. So I'm curious, Zach. He throws you sealed systems. Do you throw him Whirlpool direct drives? <laughs> um, I mean, we throw each other calls from time to time if our yeah. you know. Is it far more one-sided than both? I mean, does he throw you a lot more sealed systems than you throw him cake work? Uh, no. No, okay. it's pretty even. Oh, is it really? Okay. I mean, most of the, I mean, you know, most of the units that would even need the sealed system job, it's not, you know, feasible for the customer to throw that kind of money into a 15-year-old, you know, frigid air side by side or something like that so it, it's pretty few and far between but on the financial side of it um it's pretty even as far as the calls he sends my way and vice versa and zach i'm curious um how do you and this um you know this other company how do you guys navigate that space between first-time customer and return customer like do you guys just leave it up to them to call whoever they decide back. I don't know if you yeah. guys have follow-up yeah. processes. I mean, it's uh, it's kind of like was what was said earlier. I mean, there's enough customers to go around. Um, and I mean, he's, a, he's an older guy. He's been messing with appliances just about as long as I've been alive. So he's a great tech. Um, so, I mean, I know most of the customers I send his way, they're probably gonna call him, but um, I mean, you know, there's plenty of fish in the sea. That doesn't really bother me. Yeah. Well, it sounds like you and him have a pretty good um, business relationship going on. And if he's an older guy, at some point, he's going to close down shop. If he doesn't sell it and he closes down shop, it sounds like you have uh, opportunity to, to get that book of business. All right. I, I haven't even thought about that, but that's a very good point. There you go. That brings Alex, up a question. Is this concept new to you? Have you ever heard of losing a customer to a competitor? I mean, normally a, 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 a customer that you're visiting second, third, fourth time, that's where the money's at compared to one visit only. I mean, yeah. that's a very lopsided relationship. Yeah, uh, I me, mean, it's definitely me giving money away is giving money away. 
Yeah, it's definitely, you know, in this context, no, I haven't really thought through it or run across it this way, but I mean, you do touch on a really good point. There's a couple of ways that you want to think about <clears throat> your leads and your business and your recurring customers quantifiably, you know, it's like, what's the value of that first time customer? You know, that's somewhere between your service call, your average um, service ticket amount, you know, looking at conversion rates. That helps you understand like what makes sense when it, it comes down to um, your cost per lead. You know, you got to make sure that you're not going to pay above this much for your leads or it's not worth it. But then also if a business is tracking things like lifetime value, um, that opens up the, the world of really understanding what could or couldn't make business sense for you and help you make some business decisions so much more. Um, but, uh, but yeah, that's just kind of my usual take on lifetime value of so a customer. And it is important. When you, that, when you say that, do you mean the first time customer is more valuable or are you saying that the repeat customer? Well, I think that what he's saying is that having um, I mean, that space between first time customer and repeat customer is what's so important because it is that long term, that repeat customer, that lifetime value of a customer that is coming back to you over and over every time they have an issue. That's definitely where the value is. I would, I would argue that that's so much more valuable than just like thinking in that more short term view of just that first time customer and then, hey, what's going to happen next. I'm going to do the best I can. I'm going to represent my business well, and hopefully they call back. Um, but then there's also other ways to think of that, um, you know, calling them back 30 days later, maybe I have a warranty. It, it's all business decisions. There's many different answers that make sense for different businesses at different places, you know? Um, but I would definitely advocate for at least thinking through um, how do you take a first time customer and turn them into a repeat customer? You know, how do you turn to eliminate them advertising? Advertising is a waste of money if you don't need it and not needing it should be everybody's goal. Right. You should have to advertise Agreed. after so many years. And the only way to be able to do that in the best way is to track your information. You know, um, sorry, Mike it is to, go through the papers, you know, so to speak, but, but it is like I was saying, if you are paying attention to your numbers and kind of have certain KPIs, key performance indicators, you know, Bobby talks about PPC all the time is profit per call. You know, if you know what your average profit per call is, you're able to make a lot of really educated decisions and you can get away from the space of making decisions based on your gut, but you should, you should always listen to your gut. It's what, always what, good to have the numbers the, back it up. What's the industry standard on PPC? Did any of y'all know that? Mm -mm. I know I'd Bobby knows his PPC, it. but... <laughs> what was that, Andrew? It's going to have to depend on your own overhead. I mean, every business is going to be a little different. Yeah. Like right now, we charge a $90 service call and we lose money to walk into a house. Oh. If we're not selling a repair, we're losing money on that call. Damn. That's a lot of overhead though, right? Yeah. yeah that's what I'm thinking. Uh, Which is we why run a that 10, repeat... square foot building, we run 10 vehicles on the road. We have a parts guy, three in-house uh, receptionists, a service manager, a boss, um, an HR rep. Uh, and this is just locally owned and operated a 15 person company. Yeah. That's still, we lose, we lose money on a $90 service call. Which is why it's so important for Andrew to have that repeat customer. Hey, Bobby, we were just, uh, we were just talking about profit for call. What's your, uh, what's the, what would you say your profit per call is? What would you say kind of a standard target for a business might be? Well, for my size, my PPC is 185. It's what my, what, what my target goal is. And how, how do you calculate that? How do you calculate profit per call? Fingers. <laughs> well, you get, might have to take off your shoes so you can use your toes too. Okay. <laughs> it's all about dollars of profit. Dollars right. of profit on parts, on labor, on whatever it is that you're making money on. That's your profit per call. All right. So your basic okay. labor is going to be, you know, per appliance, per whatever you're going to work on. So let's say your basic labor on a dryer, if you're just going to do something sim simplistic, yeah, yeah. is going to be a hundred bucks. 
the big question is, is do you apply your uh, service call fee to your labor rate? Um, I do personally, um, I get a higher approval rating that way and, and it doesn't affect my PPC. So when I go through and I, I tell a customer basic labor on this to do an idler, a belt or whatever, you're looking at hundred to $110 service call fees included. And then you buy it wholesale, you sell it retail. That's the name of the game. So you, you're, you know, your parts and everything, you're shipping, whatever, um, you know, whatever you're going to add up to get you around 185 bucks you times that 185 by how many calls do you run six ten five whatever and there's your there's your you know gross for the day Whoa. um at the end of the day though that to answer that question how do you calculate you know let's just say how do you calculate this kpi right now we're talking about profit recall but it could be a different KPI. Yeah, I mean, refrigerator, dishwasher, you know, it's, whatever you work on or what brand it is, you kind of, yeah. you know, you got low end, you got, you know, uh, high end. So, I mean, of course you can't mix those two. And if you did, I mean, you're cheating yourself out of money. So kind of no matter what you're trying to track, A, know that every business is different. Mm -hmm. um, and B, it's what are you trying to track? My advice for anyone and everyone um, is so first of all, if you guys aren't keeping books, people should keep books, do it yourself, learn to do it, hire an accountant. But either way, when you're keeping your books, you have the ability to run a profit and loss statement. And I would recommend that it become part of the business process to review your profit and loss statements on a monthly basis. And that's going to start opening up first, opening up your mind to understanding, you know, where are you making money? Where are you losing money? Where are you spending it? Where are you bringing it in? But then that's really the gateway to open up to tracking your PPC or your lifetime value of a customer, et cetera, et cetera. Did you guys talk about like how you identify what your PPC is? No, not really. All right. So, I mean, you chuck out your salary, you take out your truck stock, you take out- Minimum your... PPC is what you're saying though. Do what? Minimum PPC? Yes, sir and anticipated what you want to get in order to cover costs as well as make a profit correct okay so your minimum ppc is 185 sorry go on yeah that's what i like my uh, average out to be so i mean i i hit around that number and you know my numbers will reflect good you know for the total of the day or the week or however um so add up all your expenses find out what everything is uh, divide that by you know the total number of uh of uh calendar days that you're going to be running and the total number of calls that you're going to hit and it's going to give you an average you know so here's what your salary is here's what your you know maintenance for your vehicles is your gas your fuel your parts um you know and your lunches i mean what, what however you add it in what, whatever whatever however many technicians you run or what your overhead is your storefront everything i forgot what it cost me to start my car in the morning i used to have that one sixteenth of a gallon. <laughs> is that accurate? Is that really what it is? It, it takes about a sixteenth of a gallon to start a car. Start car. Oh, I'm talking about start my whole day. Oh. No, yeah. <laughs> Three cups of coffee and twenty minutes on the pot. Sometimes it does. <laughs> okay. You guys ever work on a Northland? Yep. I'm doing a Northland freezer. Uh, do, I'm doing the whole module. Right on. Man, you know what that module retails at? Fifteen hundred. Thirty-four sixty-five. We must get a killer deal because we sell them out the door for twenty-five. Um, good profit. My my cost on it from Marvell or from Northland, which yeah. is now Marvell, um, was yeah. twenty twenty-two forty-five. One seventy for shipping. So, um, but that retail on that was thirty four sixty five. I was like, "Whoa, someone's going to Sizzler." <laughs> <laughs> hey, Bobby, watch your ice maker fill line on that. You can cut it. Watch your harnesses also. You can cut them. Pay attention when you do that job. I'm actually thinking about. Um, I, I, well, I shouldn't say I'm thinking about. I'm bringing a second guy with me, and I'm thinking about taking that door off to do it because it's built in. Don't take the door off. Well, the, I don't have the height space that I want, so it's going to be a low pull to pull that guy out. 
So I don't want to take any chances here. Either I'm putting maps over that door and then closing the door, or I'm just going to two bolt and take that whole damn door off. I've never heard a door as many as I've done. So I'll probably just throw mats over the door and, and just put it in. But I got. I like, normally keep the door open. I got 22 inches above the above the refrigerator to be able to lift that whole module out and slide it and rack it out. I don't recall what that module is as far as height, but as long as you have about two and a half inches clearance, you're clear. I'm what I'm thinking, but I was like, well, at this kind of rate, you know, I make a great profit. But if I nick a door, uh -uh, there goes my profit. It definitely doesn't hurt to have a second set of hands. That's not a bad idea. I'm not knocking you for that. Um, once you start getting good at them, though, go do them alone. Especially if you start dealing with defrost issues and you want to be able to diagnose it um, or replace the bimetal. Uh, once you get a bimetal in your stock, you're going to sell it. I bet I do 10 bimetals a year, man. Do not use a standard uh, universal bimetal, though. Use their bimetal. They're yep. different for rating. Uh, I got the condenser module as well as I went with the rotary um, uh, uh, cold control as well. I'm, I'm, if I'm going to do it, I'm just going to change them both and be done with it and have it guaranteed. I have never replaced a Northland thermostat ever. I figured I was yanking it out. Might as well change it out too. It's a totally different process, by the way. They're not really, uh, you don't really get to one by doing the other, just yeah. as by the way. But where I see, seeing where that was, I was like, oh shit, eh, eh, that won't be too bad. CYA for sure. I, I've just never done one. It was 50, it was fifty bucks, and there's a, there's enough play in it to do it. I was like, ah, eh, we'll we'll, we'll do, uh, do a little CYA on that. What do you think of that refrigerator? That's a pretty cool system, isn't it? You know, I think it's a little better than Sub Zero, personally. It's awesome. I love them. They quit producing them about four or five years ago when Marvel bought them out. They did like two more years, and then uh, they stopped making them. Well, um, well, when I called up there uh, today, when I placed the order, um, they uh, they said they're actually putting that uh, thirteen AF back on the line, and they're oh, building, they're, they're building them right now. And he says uh, they'll have uh, about thirteen. Or I'm sorry, not thirteen. They have about fifty of them up and running by Friday. Hell yeah! That's what I said. I was like, cool. All right. I just did a PM call on a Northland uh, Tuesday. Crickets. Can I run a um, Can I run an idea by you guys and see what y'all's opinion is? Yeah, shoot. Sure. So, um, as y'all know, I got my apprentice trained, and he's in a van now, um, and I, I, I he's doing great, thankfully. Um, but I'm considering hiring my next apprentice to ride with me, and I wanted him to do a longer apprenticeship. I want him to be with me for like a year or more. Um, so I was thinking about hiring a younger guy, maybe, you know, out of high school or, um, in his early twenties, uh, to ride with me, to learn the ropes and, and, and kind of be apprentice slash helper, um, for a while. And you think it's going to really, take a year? Well, I don't think it's going to take I a whole year. Depends on their background too. Yeah, I don't think it would take a full year, but I feel like a year would be a good, uh, I guess, goal to say, hey, let's let's try to get you ready within a year to be in your own van. You know, this actually came up. Uh, I was talking to Alex about this to, uh, yesterday. Uh, did you cover this yet already, Alex? No, I don't believe so. No. All right. So we, we were talking about um, like, you know, like what to talk about tonight. And some of the things that came up was. You know, where, where are you guys sourcing your techs from? Are you just throwing an ad on Indeed? Is it, you know, friends and family? Or are you hiring from experienced, you know, pool? Or are you trying to get fresh out of, uh, you know, like um, a graduate school like Samurai or something else, you know, and, and calling up Samurai and actually trying to re recruit their graduates? That's a really good idea. There's no right answer here, just so you know. Yeah, no, that's why that's, that's why it's just thrown into the conversation pit. And it's kind of like, you know, what falls in your lap pretty much. I was yeah, hired my, out of tech school. And I think uh, that was probably one of the best decisions my company's ever made was hiring me. Ha ha ha. My first apprentice that I had, he had uh, taken a 
appliance course through Amazon, and he um, was the top of his class. I interviewed several different people. He interviewed the best, so we hired him. Did you know Amazon Ready? actually does a sealed system class? Say that again. Did you know Amazon actually does a sealed system class? I think yeah, I had my, heard about that before. My, I think my actually that was from PK. Yeah, that was in one of your videos, I think. Yeah, he, he took that class. He took the 16-week course. It included SEAL systems. He's EPA certified. He's just never actually been on a torch, you know, been on a torch and actually brazed or done anything. There's just it was all book knowledge, basically. That's the that's a uh, that's scary though, because when you're playing, you know, doing SEAL system jobs, the most important part, in my opinion, at least on the repair side, is the hands-on part. Absolutely. Because you got to know, you know, what that what that copper is supposed to look like, you know, so you're not burning yeah. holes in it or making bad then, connections. That entire course through Amazon is complete bullshit. Was it a paid course? Obviously, uh, probably was. Did he pay for it? Well, yeah. Was there was there a charge for the course? No, Amazon gives it free to their employees. No, I remember you talking about this last week. Hmm. Amazon has so many employees that they're offering training courses to get them into trades because they don't they have too many employees. Like I that's the only rational explanation I can come up with. That's probably the biggest charity write off you've ever heard of in your life. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That that actually might be a good way to um, you know, just screw indeed and go through Amazon and try to funnel through there. You never know. You might get prime free for a year by hiring one of their guys. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, let me get let me get my prime membership free this year. Right. Or any I'll hire your guy if you guys give me the and, uh, Amazon books, you know. <laughs> Are most of you guys out of tech schools when you started, or did anybody actually go a ri ride along and then pick this up? Because I, I, you know, I started, I don't know, I guess it's nine years now, something like that, eight, I don't know. But uh, I rode around with my uncle for four months and then went and went ride around with another guy, and that's what I got picked up for. And, um, it was a 1099 gig, and you know, I just didn't know, you know, we had any guys like that, you know, that, you know, just like, like me, just jumped in it and rode around for four months collecting unemployment or what? Tech yeah, school I was out with, uh, <laughs> mine was a basic high school tech program that I went for um, electronics. So I learned schematics and uh, how to use the computer and how to solder in high school. Uh, so I was hired pretty much fresh out of high school, darn near. Um, I had never touched an appliance other than opening the freezer for ice cream. Um, I did about eight months right along, but most of mine was uh, back and forth between in-house and in a van. Um, I did the parts guy gig. I did the receptionist gig. Um, I learned all the sides of the entire business before they ever put me in my own van. And uh, that's how I did it. Uh, a year is not crazy for a kid, but uh, for a 24-year-old, I don't know that they're going to be able to handle $10 an hour for that long. True. My dad owned a TV repair company and he's uh, disabled. So I, I worked at a TV shop since I was 14. I learned how to solder and do conversions jobs and learned how to, you know, repair big screens before I could even drive a car. Um, so when I got to high school, I did the same thing that you guys did. And uh, I went to a, you know, a trade, trade school. Um, and when I got there, you know, I, I was pretty, pretty simple, but I did learn how um, to pretty much run through. So a really well. Yeah. It, oh, well, the solder. I was actually uh, grading the kids' solder. Yeah, that were that were my classmates. I'm like, oh yeah, your sucks. Um, <laughs> yeah, better redo that. Um, but when I got out of there and I started going into the TVs, I got with Samsung and uh, worked my way up through the the rankings. And then when I left, I did a two week training course on appliances. I rode with the guy for two weeks. That was it. That's all I needed. I was like, all right. I was easy. What with your background, yeah. Yeah. So um, uh, from there, but pretty much everything else I learned from that, I learned with my own hands. I was supposed to do six months ride along, um, but after just a little bit less than a month, they put me in a truck. But that was with a bunch of training on the front end to factory training. 
but I think it really just depends on your background. That and I had I had tech support from almost every manufacturer, so if I had any problems, I could always call through and you know go through it. So um, talk, talking with them kind of you know really evolved me pretty fast. I think that oh, was you a never call them. What? They taught you to never call them. I did. Well, the the guy at Samsung, um, his name was Tony. I don't know if you guys are, are Samsung authorized and you know Tony. Um, Tony Perkins. Um, but he was uh, originally the TV trainer in Chicago. So I went up there and I, they'd fly me up there all the time. So I actually knew Tony. So when Tony moved over to appliances, it was right around the same time I did. And talking with him, you know, it was just like, oh, hey, I got this one. And, I'm, and so it was kind of a buddy, buddy thing. Yeah, I, I did exactly what you did, Mike. I rode with a guy, uh, the guy who's my partner now. I, uh, I rode with him for, I think I did about 10 months. And, um, and then um, he helped me start my own business. I start uh, about almost a year ago. Um, my, I don't have any background repairing or learning any electrical wiring schematics. I remember taking and breaking stuff apart since I was 15, 16 years old. Um, I did a lot of um, on the shop repairs for three, four months before they throw me into a truck for like minor repairs. Um, and eventually they started giving me more, more work. Uh, so now I run at least uh, sometimes between five and eight calls a day. Uh, and that's how I started, but yeah. Good way to start in-house and then put on the road for easy stuff and then get gradually harder and harder. Yeah, once yeah, you start learning um, how to crack them all open. I got through yeah. the book pretty quick. They they didn't teach, they didn't teach me. They made me teach myself and they were there to back me up. <laughs> yeah, so back 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 when I was doing it, man, I'm 43 now. And uh back when I was doing it, man, I I I never even heard of a, a appliance a tech appliance tech school. Like I I mean, I, you know, I knew we knew about HVAC and all of that, but appliances never, it, for me, it was like sink or swim, man. <laughs> you know what I mean? I was just, you know, I, uh, uh, you know, my uncle did it, but, you know, he taught me a little bit, but, but most of it was like, you know, me going in and, 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 and you know, I, yeah, I fucked up a lot of shit. I'll be honest with you, but. It was it was a uh, sink or swim. I went to school for uh, HVAC. That's where I learned, you know, all the schematics and 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 uh, brazing and, and and all of that. But you know, it it was nothing. I I didn't have nothing available to me like far as in the appliance in the appliance world. You know, I learned um, from uh, when I became a trainer and I started actually training technicians. Um, the easiest way I learned how to tell their background was ask them one question. Um, what's the, you know, heating element? How do you check it? Appliance guys that, that came from the appliance background check by continuity. Um, guys that have a TV background check by resistance. That's funny because I would have said resistance. Yeah. <laughs> I don't have a TV background. Right. Well, I, I'm, I, I go by resistance. Uh, same thing with igniters. You know, it's, uh, you know, if you, some people will say, you know, amperage has to be over three amps. And I totally agree with that, you know, 3.2. Um, but when you look at the, um, the resistance of that igniter, you know, your brand new one's going to be 90 ohms and your one that's drawing 2.8, 2.7 is going to be 157. You know, it's, there's your problem. Check for voltage and check for amp draw. Yep. No, check for resistance and check for current. Oh. If it if it's lighting up, it's got voltage. What if it ain't lighting up? That's what I'm right. saying. Check for voltage and check for amp draw. Right. No, this was good, guys. Um, I'm gonna have to hop off. I'll totally keep the room open for you guys. Um, but did you uh, get anything out of it, Alex? Yeah, no, this was this was actually a great call. Um, like always, you know, the value in these calls come from those of you guys that come and, and participate. So thank you. I really liked what was going on with that kind of like mock diagnosis. Maybe we can do that a little bit more for, for guys that are having trouble with stuff. Um, 
but uh, but yeah, I'll um, I'll be back here same time um, next week. <laughs>